Awesome. Great. Hello, everybody. Uh, welcome to this evening's webinar. Uh, it's a bit of a special session today because we are going to be tackling the subject in, um, in English. Uh, but don't worry about it uh, tomorrow and from now on we'll be going back to Romanian. However, uh, if you wish to address any question during this presentation, please feel free to do so uh, in the Q&A box. And you can do it either in English or in Romanian in any way you feel uh, comfortable and in any language you wish. And uh, I'm really pleased to see uh, so many of you joining in uh, at the very beginning of this week. Uh, it seems that the book, Bootcamp for Unbreakable Romania, the National Cybersecurity Contest, uh, is going full speed ahead. And uh, without further ado, I would like to introduce today's speaker, uh, Razvan. He's an associate professor at the University Polytechnica in, Buc in Bucharest. Uh, but I will let him tell you more about himself and uh, about the subject that he's going to be presenting today. Um, just as a bit of a surprise, uh, a surprise uh, you will be involved more than uh, you were uh, last week. Uh, but I will let him tell you. So, Razvan, I'm now handing this over to you. Okay. Uh, thank you so much, Adina. Uh, hi, everyone. It's very nice to, to be here. Uh, I'm Razvan. Uh, I'm part of the, let's say, open source slash open system slash security community in Romania and uh, well, a bit, I think, in uh, outside the world. Um, I was invited to be part of uh, Unbreakable, and I thought, what are some, what is some interesting item I could share with you guys? And uh, given the fact that I'm part of the Unicraft project for the past two to three years. Uh, and it's a project that deals with security and low-level aspects and uh, software and everything. Uh, I thought it would have been a, the kind of the best way to, to share that information uh, to you at this webinar. So I'm not going to go into the more classical way of doing a, a talk uh, with slides and everything. What I'm going to use is I'm going to use uh, the whiteboard and then I'm going to show you guys a demo on uh, demos actually. Uh, on our um, uh, on my uh, my terminal to see how it goes as we're going to delve into the subject of uh, unikernels and particularly unicraft the the unikernel project I'm involved in uh, which is a very cool open source uh, research uh, research centric project now my talk is uh, usually when I'm doing this kind of talks I want to get some uh, input from you guys. So I'm going to ask questions, and I know that you can't use your uh, uh, your voice channel, but uh, I'm expecting that you can uh, use the chat, uh, and I'm going to see there what your answers are, and then move on with the with the presentation, with the discussion. So uh, the key key items here are going to be uh, operating systems, Unikernel, uh, something that's called library OSs, and generally speaking, is going to be on software reconfigurability and uh, reducing the code base as such to ensure security. Uh, for starters, let's kind of start more high level and I will start with the, with the topic of software. And I'm going to ask something I'm, I'm also uh, asking on uh, most of my lectures, which is what are the main differences between software and hardware? What does software have that, uh, that hardware doesn't have? So you, you can, uh, you can uh, send your answers on the chat. Uh, they can be in Romanian or in English, uh, that's no problem. What are some particularities with software versus hardware? And I'm going to note that down uh, as you answer them or I'm going to provide the answer myself. Okay, so we have from Stefan, he mentioned flexibility. Let's add it here, flexibility. Okay, what else? Is there anything else particular to software than hardware? Software can be made more easily debugged. So, okay, let's say easy, and I'm going to say here easy a lot of things. Uh, it's going to be easy to develop, development. Uh, it's going to be easy to debug. It's easy to deploy. It's easy to test when compared to hardware, right? So it makes things easy. Uh, Gabi mentioned something interesting here. It has security flaws. This is kind of 
very much connected to flexibility because if you have something flexible, that's going to increase the number of issues that we have. Okay, Katalin mentioned that hardware only understands machine code, which is very important, uh, but that's also coming here, which means software knows many things. You needn't usually just use the, 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 the machine code. You can have any sort of flexibility. Okay, and we have from um, from um, Fabian software has user interface. Okay, so it has kind of let's say the user is closer to the software here. That's important. Um, Andre Raiko mentioned software refers to the instructions or hardware refers to physical components. Okay, yeah. So software is something you can you can actually code. Uh, and Eddie mentioned software has increased complexity. So kind of flexibility is also coming up with increased uh, uh, increased uh, complexity and then with security flaws and everything like that. Okay, this is fine. Now, uh, what would be from your point of view, why, uh, I mean, if you were to select from this, what is the major, major, major advantage of software when considering development? Why is it easier for people? Why are so many people passionate about software development? Why can we, why, why is it so fun, so cool, so creative, so easy to do? What, what's that more, abst more uh, so abstraction? Okay, reusability, very, very good, Andrea. So this is an item I want to focus on. The item of, and I'm going to capitalize this, reusability. Software is reusable. And by reusable, we don't necessarily mean that I can use it and then I give a copy of it, of it and you can use it. It's I can use it and then I can, uh, I, I can use it in my development. I can reuse it, right? So I can use it, but then I can reuse that software component and make any sort of interesting items from it, right? And what Andrea mentioned as part of her answer was that this part of software is called, we're going to use libraries. And this is a very, very important part. So let's just split software into two types of software. Let's split software in what we'll call, let's say applications and libraries. Right now, applications needn't necessarily be things that the user deals with. There may be any sort of application. There can be applications that are interactive, or you can have daemon processes or services or so daemons or services items that be uh, that the, any sort of uh, uh, system has to has to work with. Right. So these are our components. We have libraries and we have applications. Of course, libraries are the important part here because every libraries are usable. That's the point with libraries. You just pick them up, you link them to your program, you get something else. Frameworks, PHP, Python, whatever you want. These are libraries, you just install it, someone did that, and then you just create a small API, a small program on top of that, and you're able to reuse it. So the major, major, major force of software is its reusability. And during the past 10, 20 years, as more and more software got developed, that allowed people to more easily get a tons, tons of other features. The, uh, when, let's say 10, 15 years ago, open source wasn't such a common thing. People were saying, I am not sure open source. There was this kind of very, um, intense struggle between the open source community and Microsoft. Now, Microsoft was, uh, was uh, releasing out of code as open source. Microsoft is owning GitHub. So kind of, let's say, open source has won because a lot of software is now open source. Google, Facebook, Amazon, all the major companies are doing this. There's a lot of pieces of software out there. Just pick them up and reuse them and build your own stuff with it. And you have multiple options as well. If you want to have some sort of image processing libraries, there are, there are tons of them to pick from. If you want to do encryption, once again, tons of libraries, tons of components that you can reuse. 
This is what's out there. Thousands, hundreds of thousands of pieces of software that you can pick up and reuse on your own will. Now, this has been happening to a lot of items. You can, about, we talked about image processing libraries. We talked about protocols. We, uh, people that are using libraries to uh, interconnect, using libraries to create uh, uh, graphic, uh, graphical uh, interfaces, game engines, whatever. These have been overused. There's a particular part, however, that hasn't that much kind of changed during the past, past, uh, past years, and that is operating systems. Now, for, the, for, for a discussion point, an operating system, does it seem more like an application or a library, an OS, an operating system? What do you think? An application or a library, an OS. Andre said more, of, more like library, Catalin library. Any other opinion? Julian said both, Alex said both. Okay, so just for the sake of discussion, let's do it like this. So let me uh, remove uh, this a bit and let's talk a bit about operating systems and that will be our entry point into unikernels and unicraft and all those cool things that you can do with it. So an operating system is a software layer on top of the hardware. So the hardware has that those machine code instructions that we usually call, call the ISA, instruction set architecture. This is the lower the, the lowest la layer of interfacing and this is where the hardware and the, and the software interact. The hardware, the CPU actually, presents you some instructions, some register that you, have, you work with. On top of this, you create abstractions. The most important abstraction you create on this is the operating system. The operating system itself is also called an extended hardware machine. So it's, it simply abstracts away the hardware. The, the hardware simply just gives you some sort of instruction, but the operating system interface gives you specific actions. For example, it gives you memory management, MM. It gives you IO interface. It gives you what I call PM or TM, process management or thread management. It gives you networking support. It gives you file system interfacing. It gives you time management. All those items, it wraps around the hardware and provides you this extensive, this rich interface that you can then use to run applications on top of. And I know that, for example, due to the way Windows is built and some other people you say, ah, Windows is an OS. The actual OS, the technical term for the OS is called the kernel. This is the, 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 the core of the operating system. Everything running on top of that is not the OS. Everything on top of that are applications, are maybe some others. The actual operating system is here. On top of this operating system layer, you usually have some sort of libraries. The most important one is called the libc, the standard C library, but there are some other, uh, let's say, low-level libraries out here, low-level libs. And on top of those, you create the applications, application one, application two, and so on. This is the way they work, and this is the operating system providing you this interface. This is something that if you look into any sort of, I'm going to do a share screen. If you're going to look into any sort of um, Android or iOS software architecture, you're going to see this. So let's just do a share screen and check this out. Um, just a sec. Uh, Android, okay. 
Okay, so I, I, I search here for the Android software stack and I'm now looking and you can see this is a simplified one. This is a more complicated one and so on. So this is the Android software stack. Uh, yeah, so the app, the, this is the Linux kernel providing interface and then you have all sorts of libraries and then the applications on top of that. Then this is another one, once again, the Linux kernel, this is the kernel, the core OS and the others and so on. Let's also go, this is a more complex one. So once again, the Linux kernel with the core services and then everything built on top of that. Let's go into the iOS software architecture, software, uh, no, iOS uh, architecture. What software architecture? It should be something similar. Uh, let's look for a simplified one. This is a bit too complicated. Uh, yeah, let's look into this. Okay, so this is similar to the Android one. Just a sec. This is the Android one with the Linux kernel, and then the iOS is a very is is close to that one. Sorry, my this internet connection isn't that good. So once again, the kernel, the core OS, and op operating all these uh, additional layers on top of that. So this is the way all all modern software works, right? You get this kernel here, and then everything covers on top of that. And because of this, the operating system, the kernel, is actually a library. The, the only difference here is that it usually runs in a privileged domain. We call this kernel mode, such that when it runs, it's going to have uh, additional privileges that are not allowed here. You cannot, from the application one, communicate with, for example, the disk or the networking without passing the operating system. So the operating system is a core component that makes sure nothing bad happens. That's why a lot of, uh, most of the uh, uh, systems out there, be them laptops, servers, mobile devices, are going to use an operating system kernel to cover for these, for these layers. All right. Now, the sheer existence of the operating systems, the operating system has major benefits. Can you tell me what are the most important advantages of having an operating system? So having some sort of this library covering the hardware, what does the operating system bring? What would things be without the operating system on your, on your device or system? What do we gain from the operating system? Brings uniformity. Okay, so layer of abstraction. Okay, so the, the, the thing is what Andre mentioned is uniformity. So what does uniformity mean? I mean, what is the advantage of uniformity? What does that actually mean to me? Why is uniformity an advantage? Portability. Thank you, Julian. So this is portability, which means I'm going to run under x86 on a different CPU. I'm going to run under ARM. I'm going to use different network devices, different disks different monitors, different whatever devices, the OS is going to get this thin layer on top of these items and making things portable. I'm going to create my application and then this application will only be required to run under this operating system and then it will run on all platforms. That's why if you port something on Linux and then Linux runs on ARM powered PC MIPS, it should be okay to run on all of these uh, items. More than that, the standard C library is usually another portable interface that allows given applications to run on the different OS. So this also gives you some portability. What else? Apps can run different hardware. Simplicity, yeah, we can develop the hardware easier. We don't have to develop now the hardware using this very uh, low level and hard to use interface, the ISA. We simply use this layer. This is called the system call layer, system call, that gives us uh, a, 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 an easier way to, to develop and run the applications. All right. 
So we have all these items. This is the, so the advantage of the, the DOS is this, it gives us portability and it comes with security. I have application one. Can application one tamper with the memory application do, which is can it break security? Can this application steal data from this application? How can it do it, Andre? How can one application steal data from the other application? Assume applications are perfectly coded and they are not malicious and they are not vulnerable. So let's assume that. Non-vulnerable, non-malicious applications. Can one application see data from the other application? So yeah, my, my, my point here is that it cannot if everything is okay. So the operating system isolates application together. Yeah, so as Julian mentioned, if memory is properly managed by the OS, this doesn't happen. So if the OS wasn't there, they, they, they wouldn't be able to run. They would, you have two applications, they would be able to steal data from each other with no problem. The OS, provide this isolation. So we have the benefits of the OS, which are portability and isolation. It ensures isolation and by that it ensures a level of security. Once again, there are indeed vulnerabilities, but it provides a, a, this layer of uh, security. So we have portability, we have uh, kind of, let's see, services plus API already provided. We, we, we don't need to reuse, we, know, we don't need to implement file systems. They're already out there. We don't need to implement networking stacks. They're already out there. We don't need to implement IEO communication. It's already out there. So this is already done. We are simply reusing the DOS as a library. However, so these are on the plus side. DOS has downsides. Any sort of architecture such as this has downsides. What are the downsides of an OS? Overhead. Why is there overhead? Andre Gabi. And complexity. Let's call, let's let's add them, them both here. Overhead and complexity. Do you know how many lines of code are there in the Linux kernel currently? I don't know for sure, so let me also, also look for that. Let's say Linux kernel number of lines of code. 27.8 million million lines of code in 2020. 27.8 million lines of code in the Linux kernel in 2018. Just to give you an idea of what's happening there. So we have complexity because of this huge item and especially multi parts. We have overhead. Why is there overhead? So 28 million. Why is there overhead? What's causing the overhead? Okay. This actually isolation and portability. These cause overhead. If we want to isolate, we want to have some sort of layer where this application doesn't talk to this application. We won't say, hey, if you want to talk to this, go through me, right? It's like whenever you want to kick the hell out of your brother or sister, we don't judge, you have to do, you go through your parent. That's overhead. You just want to, to beat them, right? So 
no overhead would mean not passing through the OS. There are some ways you can you can go past that, but that doesn't, doesn't usually happen. So if two applications want to inter interact with each other, they usually go to the OS. If an application wants to discuss the, to the hardware, they usually go to the OS. There are uh, different optimizations to narrow this, but the OS for isolation does this and for portability as well. Any sort of portability layer means adding an additional layer to make sure that everything works okay is going to add overhead. And Eddie, the size and the attack surface are correlated to complexity. So complexity means size, means boot time, performance, performance, and we also call attack surface or security. These are all affected by the way the kernel works. So what do we do about that? What are ways around it? Can we actually do something about it? And, and if we can, what? And if, if that could be done, why hasn't it been done yet? So what we could do is the following. Let's strip the complexity. And how do we do that? We make the kernel modular. Let's break the kernel into small pieces and tie them together. So let's put the memory management in one piece, the ion one piece, the, uh, the, the performance management. So let's kind of, instead of a monolithic kernel, so instead of a gigantic piece, this is called monolithic, monolithical OS. Let's break it into chunks. Let's have some sort of components that have some sort of interaction with each other. This is kind of a modular approach. We have actually done some uh, measurements and the Linux kernel itself is very tightly coupled. You, you can't easily break things. You have to get a, a, a large batch of those items even if some of them you don't want or if some of them you don't configure. So you want to have things modular. You want to have also things configurable. So I have to want, I want, I want to have multiple modules, but I want each module to be configured. Maybe for a particular cases, I don't want all those features. So how do I do this? If I were to break this, this is the approach of a, what we call a micro kernel. The downside is that now I'm breaking things and these have to interact with each other so the overhead doesn't disappear because I still have this isolation to take care of. What else can I do? So I'm breaking the kernel in pieces, but if I'm breaking it over here, maybe some things will go into the uh, uh, higher layer, the lower layer. It's not going to actually cause me to reduce the overhead. Maybe it's going to increase the overhead. It's going to reduce the complexity. It's going to increase, increase the configurability, but the overhead doesn't disappear. So what can I do then? What, what, should, I, uh, what, should, I, what should I do then? Uh, once again, a micro kernel, this is the approach, is still going to cause this isolation. It's still going to cause a lot of overhead. This is what iOS, what Darwin, what others are doing. So let's do something completely different. Let's give up all our assumptions and start thinking differently. And we start thinking differently considering what's already happening out there. And what's already happening out there is that people are now, I mean, it's not actually your usual OSs, but because of virtualization, because of the advance of the cloud, uh, uh, cloud software, People are now just, hey, I want this to be done. I don't care how, just do it. And this has uh, kind of uh, ignited the, the kind of the, the cloud, uh, the, the cloud uh, development of topics such as SAS or FAS. And these have until now been using what we call containers 
and you, what you may know of as Docker. There are some other containers, but is the, this is the major technology behind of that, right? So this has been happening in the past years. What does that mean? It means that you get some piece of application and say, I want you to do this. Do this for me, give me the result, and that will be. SAS stands for Software as a Service. FAAS stands for Function as a Service. Just expose me this function and do something that I want to do. This is what Amazon Lambda is doing. Amazon Lambda. Uh, this is, if I recall, Google Cloud Function. I think this is it, GCF. I, I think this is the name for it. It may, be, it may be something different, Google Cloud Function. What they are doing behind the scenes, they are usually doing containers, a minimal, a very minimal uh, uh, set of uh, software that's being used in a containerized environment, in isolated environment, to boot them up. So how this looks like is you have the hardware, you have the OS, and then you run small applications as containers. This is container one, this is container two, container three, and so on, and so on. This is one approach. However, because these run on the same OS, if something bad happens to this OS, everything is going to fall down. And because this OS, usually Linux is very complex, that kind of brings you overhead and complexity, which means also lack of security. So what do we do about it? Well, let's think of it as very, very different. Do we actually need multiple applications running on the same OS for cloud services? I mean, yes, I need Microsoft Teams, I need Zoom, I need the terminal, I need the browser, I need an email client. But for an actual business use case, do I need multiple applications running on a given OS or something like that? Well, you'd say yes, you want because you don't want to have eight gigabytes, 32 gigabytes of RAM and eight cores and run one application. And then I say, yes, you're right. You're right. But let's assume this. We have powerful hardware. Let's say I have 16 cores, 64 gigabytes of RAM, and 10 terabytes of this, whatever, on a given system. One thing is, let's put an OS on that and then run multiple applications and you can take care of that. Yes, but the OS adds overhead and the OS is complex. Can't we do things differently? Yes, we can. Let's not worry about the OS and let's just add a very thin layer here, which you may know as a hypervisor. A virtualization layer, things such as Zen, such as Microsoft Hyper-V, or the very recent, this is part of actual Team Romania, Amazon Firecracker. KVM. Have this thin layer with only the minimal requirements and it is a hypervisor. And then everything else running as an application. No OS for the application. Usually people, when they run fully fledged virtual machines, so this is kind of the the, the, the virtual machine, you have an OS on the virtual machine, you have an application, maybe multiple applications, you have all of this as a virtual machine. No, 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 no. Let's just use a virtual machine with an entire application in time gap. No OS, no user mode, kernel mode, no separation, no isolation within the machine. Just run that virtual machine and create that virtual machine from all the bits required. So that means application bits, OS bits, and library bits, tie them all together into a singular image that does one thing and does that thing well and run it. 
we call this image a unikernel. Having a unikernel is then going to give you reduced complexity. You're just going to pick every, this is the OS. These are the libraries. We're going to also have different libraries, right? Lists that are also modular, that are configurable. Just pick what you want, configure what you want as part of the OS. Just pick what you want, configure what you want as part of the lib. Get the application, link them all together into a singular image and run it. That image may be a, a web server, that may be a machine learning service, image recognition program, you name it. You get that virtual machine, tiny virtual machine, one max, two max, build it, run it, do your thing with it, and that would be it. Yeah, minimalistic, I want to say OS images, minimalistic application images. It's not just the OS, it's the OS, the libraries and the applications doing that one thing. There's no multiple applications here, there's no context switch. You can still have multi-threading inside this one to use multiple cores, but just tie everything together into this singular image. Reduce size, reduce the tax surface, maximal performance because you don't have any sort of context switch here. You are running almost directly on hardware, except you're using the hypervisor to make this switch, uh, this uh, VM uh, uh, um, management, and that would be it. So then you get rid of the overhead, you get rid of the complexity of the, uh, the attack surface, and you get increased performance. And this is what unicorns are about. Increased performance, increased security, increased configurability. Of course, there's a catch. The catch is fragility. Because now you have, yeah, it, it's very close to the I'm going to, to get on that. The, the, the downside is that you're, you're now having to be very careful how things are going to tie down. You have all those large palettes of libraries and, uh, and uh, OS modules that now have to be tightly coupled together to create this app. And this isn't an easy, uh, an easy thing to do. When you have those many pieces that you can basically, you can, you can think of them as Lego pieces, right? You can Lego them in anything. You have to make sure that for every sort of plain house robot you want to build, they fit properly. So this is the, the downside, kind of a fragility and making sure that everything works. And for example, for Unicraft, there are maybe tens, hundreds of builds that you want to look into. You want to go into all the configuration possible and see, hey, do these things really work? But that high configurability also gives you the power to select the best one for your use case. You can't break the Linux kernel in pieces. We had a discussion some, uh, about it ago with, uh, with some people from a company in Romania, and they said we are trying to break things into small pieces, and with Linux kernel we can't do it, but Unicraft, the Unicronal, seems like a good idea. It will allow us to break things into the small pieces, only select the items we need, inside that item configure it specifically for our use case, so for this application, and that will be it. So basically, what that would mean in the end, it means this. You would have uh, kind of what, what would be the vision of this. Just a sec. Let's assume you have your application. The, the, own, the application code. And then what you, what you have are, let's say, libraries that you have multiple types of libraries. Now, ideally, there are, each library is going to expose an API. So for example, these are going to, to be, let's say, crypto libraries. They are going to expose a similar API. And you're going to select the one that you need based on your preferences. Select one, select two, or select three. There are, there's another library giving you an, uh, a given API 
with multiple implementations and so on. The DLS itself is basically similar to libraries because that's what it is. It has file system one, file system two, file system three. Exposing an API, you just read what you want. You have memory allocation, alloc. You have allocator one, allocator two, allocator three, just pick what you want. You get them all together, and each of these components is also having some sort of configuration, config. You config each of them according to your needs and then them together. So for example, you're going to have item one over here, file system three from here, uh, application three from here, each of them with their given configuration and you tie them all inside the unikernel image and then you run them on top of Zen or Firecracker or some hypervisor you want to see fit. And that will give you all those advantages that we talked about. It's similar to Docker, right? So it's similar to Docker, but it, the Docker has still the OS here. Here, there's no OS. It's only the hypervisor and only one application. Everything is tied to that reduced, as reduced as possible, as small as possible, giving you small image size, small memory footprint, fast boot time, fast running time. So there was a question from Julian. Why have the OS then? Won't the NSDK provided by the hardware developer be sufficient? Yes. The answer is yes. The OS is still required for devices such as this. I need to have multiple applications on my device. I want to have a messenger. I want to be able to use Zoom. I want to have a calendar. Devices, interactive devices, the ones that I'm using, so uh, laptops, uh, these kind of items, the smart TV, smart cars, they are not for the unicorn use case. These are for the interacting ones. Yeah, general purpose devices. Thank you, Alex. However, specific de specific devices can be can fall into one of these items. The cloud thing where you kind of get services will have the hypervisor layer and then unikernel images running on top of those. That's the first use case. And then there is another very interesting use case. We call this the bare metal use case. What is bare metal? You get an application, a unikernel image, and you run that unikernel image on top of the hardware. One hardware, one application, that's it. And that's very useful for embedded world. In the embedded world, I don't, I don't want an OS. I don't want an OS to run a single application. I just want to run that application and that application only. So you tie everything up and you run that bare metal. If you only have reduced resources, nothing uh, very, not, you don't want an OS for that. You don't want multiple applications. You just want one application. You can run that one application as bare metal. That's the second use case for unicorns, the ability to run the bare metal. Do one thing, do that one thing on that hardware with no other OS there whatsoever. And everything, everything, the nice thing is going to have this large array of libraries of software components that are just going to tie together to do what you want. There's a part of these components that we call platform code. So for example, plat one, or plat two, the platform code is the code for Z or FICAC or KVM. You get that code and then you build the image for Z, you build the image for, for FICAC, or you build the platform bare metal, where you have to tie some sort of bootloader and build it there. There are also, as part of the OS, you have the Arch libraries, R, x86, Mix, we are now working for RIST 5. These are architecture libraries. They expose an API, you tie them together, and then you are able to build an image running on KVM for R, uh, an image running on Zen for f and so on. Of course, they, these have to combine somehow. Not all combinations are possible, but still, this is something that you can have access to. So imagine this large array of components that you can tie together and get that, you, that one application image for those two use cases. 
cloud operators running that image for a given service, only that one, that may be Nginx, that may be TensorFlow, whatever, or running it mere metal on some sort of small device. Uh, the difference between uh, Alex Petran, the difference um, between a unicorn and the current embedded practices, well, it's uh, it's it's actually not not that much of a difference. But what? Yeah. So you don't have the, any any OS. The unicorn will basically give you a large flexibility. You, you, you can pick everything you want. So uh, the the kind of why this is an ongoing and I would say never ending work is there are always other possible implementations that want to expose here. And then maybe a, a given application wants to have that. So as part of Unicorn work, you have multiple items. One of the item is more libraries. What, what we call more APIs. So maybe I don't have an API for, uh, I'm not sure, um, MQTT as a protocol. I want to have this API. Then I have this API. For each API, I can have more implementations. And then, OK, I want to use MQTT, but I now have two implementations for MQTT. Which can I use? Maybe I, I use one or the other. If I want one to be more secure, one to be uh, with increased efficiency, one with reduced attack surface, I can choose which one to, which one to use. The other one that I want to do as part of the uh, of, as part of this is uh, more configurations. So maybe I can still I, I can still break. So I, I'm breaking things down within the software component itself. Maybe if I'm going to tune this to two megabytes or one megabyte or uh, uh, two items in the queue, I can get more performance for my use case. Yeah, so everything here is for a particular use case, everything is configurable. And then number of four, four, four is, of course, more applications. Applications have, have to be kind of ported on top of this infrastructure and recompiled as we see fit. You take Nginx, you take Apache, you take uh, Kafka, whatever you want, and you have to have all those things built in, and then you have to build it in this new infrastructure. As usually, uh, 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 for example, usually compile them in Linux or some other component. Now you have all this large palette of infrastructure and you have to tie them together to port these applications. So these four items are always here. Not to mention that these libraries and APIs include platforms, hypervisors, for example, we are working towards complete firecracker support and more architectures. Risk five, I just mentioned, maybe there's something new, there is some sort of new architecture, new item coming about. You want to have that included in this architectural library that's part of what we call the core OS. So this is the this is the world of Unikernels. This is the world that Unicraft is part of, and this is what Unicraft is aiming to do. Most of the thing that we are now focusing on is getting kind of this as many features as possible and getting them to be used by uh, any sort of business who's going to deploy their services on the cloud with minimized uh, uh, any size, increased performance, increased security, reduced code base. This is kind of what's, what's, what's aiming. And this is kind of a dual, a, a three, I would say it's a three, a three track. There's an open source track. There is a business slash industry track uh, that's currently being pursued. And there's also an academic track. Hey, what can we do with some sort of research interest in part of the OS? And these things are going simultaneously at this point. So they are kind of supporting each other. The open, the open source side, the business slash startup slash industry side, and the academic slash research side. And we'll see how it goes. It's something that we are, we are uh, enthusiastic about and we want to see how, the, how everyone reacts to it. And there are some very nice results. So we were able to prove that we can use Nginx to get superior performance to the way Linux works as part of a key VM-based uh, build.
with nginx and some others but it's, it's kind of ongoing or because you have to do this you you have the possibility of doing all those configurations but of course it means some uh, a bit of effort to get all of these uh, all of these items all right uh, let's get two minutes to kind of grab this uh, this information and this overview and then I can show you some actual demos of how things are working with Unicraft, one of the uh, the kernels and the Unicronal we are working on and uh, we want to see it as the kind of the, the top Unicronal project uh, uh, out there. And just as a, a kind of a, a marketing scheme, we are constantly looking for contributors and developers. So uh, there is a Discord channel. There is uh, the, the GitHub uh, is full of documentation and uh, items and uh, and issues to solve. So it's a live project that there is about twenty or thirty people, um, uh, a bunch of students that are working on this. So it's a very uh, kind of hot and uh, actively developed project. So if you want to be part of that, of this kind of very cool low level OS specific with the potential to do this revolution, uh, revolutionizing of uh, uh, cloud deployment, please join us. It's all open source. It's, uh, uh, it's all fun and it's very challenging technically. Not to mention you're going to learn, to learn a lot. Yeah, it's mostly C. Uh, it's uh, uh, yeah, actually yeah. The, so most of the of the so the core OS parts, the core OS libraries are in C and assembly. Naturally, you don't have any other options. But now we are working, and it's more more or less complete Rust support, so that you can build Rust applications on top of it. And maybe ideally in the future we would be able to rewrite components in Rust. We want to write components in D, in the deep language. So D and Rust are kind of these safe programming languages. We are actively working towards proper D and Rust support in the Unicronal, such that you would both port Rust and D applications that are highly secure and less error prone than C and C++ applications. But also those libraries themselves, we can provide implementations in Rust or in D. They would add a bit of overhead but the security benefit may over may, uh, may be better than having the implementation. Yeah. So this is it's kind of, there's also another very interesting work, academic work, is called FlexOS. You can uh, it's going to likely likely uh, be published in the in the next month. Uh, FlexOS. Uh, this is part of the research uh, research track of Unicraft is getting all those libraries and splitting them into what we call security compartments with security guarantees for each of those. And kind of you then make some sort of uh, complex formula of performance versus security, and you choose the best configuration. Say, hey, I want this. Flex OS is kind of based on Unicraft and doing this. Those, those compartments, splitting them into different privileges level, there are some sort of gates of interconnection and uh, gives you this flexibility that we call FlexOS in uh, balancing performance with security. Kind of look it up, FlexOS. Uh, if you're going to look it on Google, there is there has been a workshop paper, uh, I think four or five months ago. So let me give you the name, FlexOS, and you can uh, check a bit more on that. But still, everything is happening on, on GitHub for Unicraft, and you can see uh, everything uh, everything there. And there are tons of projects. I mean, we are we are we are going with uh, with fuzzing. We are trying to do fuzzing for OS. Is now that they are split, maybe we can do full fuzzing of these components. Uh, there are people working on VM cloning based on Unicraft, where instead of starting a, a, a virtual machine from from a, from from zero, you are just cloning or what we call a copy on write from the OS. We are we are cloning an existing one. And reducing the uh, the startup time. So there are there are a lot of cool projects happening, both on the open source side, on the research side, and on the industry side. It's a very large project at this point, and I'm going to demo it uh, uh, one minute from now.
Okay, so are there any more questions from your side or, or should I go to the, to the demos? To just see, kind of show it in action. Okay, demo it is. Um, let's go here. All righty. So I'm going to assume you see my screen. If anything, please uh, uh, show me on uh, show me on the chat. So um, let's start from zero. I'm going to kind of create an application. How how what are all the steps on getting? Uh, a unikernel image running. So, if we're going to go to GitHub, um, this is the this is our organization. Let me also give you give the link to it on uh, on the chat. Just a sec. Uh, this is where everything is uh, is happening. So, uh, on Unicraft, uh, the most important item here. So, there was a paper. You can also see a lot of things here in Euro Euro Eurosys twenty twenty one. Uh, the most important item you want to see here is the Unicraft core. So Unicraft here is kind of an OS replacement. What we have in Arch, uh, let, let me clone the repo and then uh, we can uh, work with that. So let's do... Um, mm, I'm not sure how to do it. I don't like the Nginx bin, but let's, let's put it here. Okay. So let's, let's clone this here. This is the core Unicraft set of uh, components and let's look through it. So what we have in Unicraft, this is the platforms. These are the platforms. So currently there's support for KVM, for Zen. Linux U is what we call a compatibility platform, meaning you are able to create an executable that's running directly on Linux. But KVM and Zen are the two platforms that are now fully supported. We are working towards Firecracker integration. We are also looking to Hyper-V and some others. Uh, the Arch part, the two architectures supported are ACT6 and ARM. So these are the architecture parts. Once again, they are more or less also seen as libraries. Uh, and then as part of the libraries, we have the APIs. So these are the core libraries that would actually see as part of an operating system. So for example, we have allocators and allocators are UK alloc, UK alloc body, pool and region. And, and if, you go on, uh, if you go here on the main repo, there are also some outside, out, out, of, out of three libraries. For example, there is one that's called TLSF, which is an, a memory allocator. This is the one. And there is one that's called lib uh, tiny lock, if I recall. Let me see if that is the case. Yeah, so lib tiny lock, which is another allocator. So apart from these core allocators, we call them core libraries. There are also external libraries, as we call it, for the unikernel. And everything here. This is the bootloader. This is the uh, CPIO image um, uh, image uh, archiver. Uh, Nine PFS. It's a file system support. We have. VFS core for a uh, virtual file system, software random, random nine numbers, signals, uh, cooperative scheduler. We are considering uh, implementing a preemptive scheduler, uh, ring buffers, scheduling, uh, memory mapping, uh, argument parsing, uh, RAM file system support, um, file, file descriptor table, some sort of POSIX related information. These are all here. There's now support for UPSAN. UPSAN is part of uh, ASAN, address sanitizer, means undefined behavior sanitizer. So these are all part of this repo. The way things go here uh, are very well marked in this, uh, in this uh, image. So this is kind of the way you are going to build a unikernel image. You have those, what we call the library pools, the platform pools, you select the platform that you want, and then you have the core, the main library pools, and then anything on top of those. You simply select what you want and you build your application. There is another image on that over here, right? So you have the application, you have some sort of C library, then you have intermediary layer, what we call the POSIX layer, then the core libraries, this is the API, and this is implementations for it. You just, you just select which, which ones you want. 
You want the body allocator, you want TLSF, you, you, you want tiny malloc, you simply select those. So this is the API, and this is the selection of the implementation. And then some others, and finally, everything get built up into a given application. So let's look into that. So we now have the, we have the unikernel here, and now let's try to build an application. Uh, so, sorry, sorry, sorry. I, I think I have to interrupt you for a bit. Some of the per participants say that uh, uh, that they cannot see the entire screen. Oh, uh, yeah. I'm not Thank sure you. if that's okay. I can see it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. of it's course, of course. It's 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 yeah. fine. Thank you for mentioning that. Uh, sorry, Adina. Thank you. No, so, sorry uh, on my side for the delay. Uh, is it better now? Guys, can you see the screen now? So I, I, I'm not sure. So I think it maybe have to do in the window. Let me, yeah, let me, let me do the share screen entire thing. Let me just do that. Yeah, they're, they're saying that they can see just. Yeah, sorry, screen. sorry for that. Yeah, uh, I, I shared the, I shared the terminal. And I was, I was uh, also showing the browser. My bad. It's, uh, it's on my side. So this is the, sorry, this is the. Uh, can you now see the this architecture? Okay, awesome. Yeah, sorry for that. I, I completely forgot that I only shared the terminal and I was showing you guys how the uh, um, how the architecture looks like. So this is once again, uh, this is the architecture. Here are the um, uh, the, li the architecture library pools. These are the platform library pools. These are all the kind of the core libraries and these are the applications that can build with it. A more interesting one is the one here. So this is the application. You have a very thin layer. This is this is very similar. If you go into Android or any sort of software, you have this. That's what you have here as well. But these components are highly configurable, very small. Uh, you can select multiple implementations for one API, and you only end up with a, with one image that you can then run on top of a hypervisor with reduced. Uh, reduced code um, uh, uh, code base and uh, uh, fast booting and fast running time. Okay, so the, the VFS core API that, that you can choose between RAMFS, there's X3 work on the way, 9PFS, any sort of item such as this, you can choose among them, right? So these are the items uh, that you're going to look into. La uh, so all of this tied down particularly to your needs. Sorry again for uh, for uh, not looking into the uh, uh, for only sharing the uh, the terminal in the first place. So let's go into a very simple application. This is a hello world application, and let's see how it how this works. Okay, so we have uh, we're going to get the application here, and I'm going to show you how 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 this is going to work. So let's clone this. Okay, so we have app hello world. And here, let's look at some items. So this is reliant on what we call the make file. The make file is going to point to the Unicraft source code and many sorts of libraries we're going to use. Currently, we aren't using any sort of library. So this is this is something we, we, we are just going to use the application and the Unicronal. We are not going to link anything else. Make file and Unicronal. As part of make file that you can, we simply define what, what application, what, uh, what is the source code file we're using, and we're just using this main.c. Now, this is fairly complicated, so I'm going to simplify this as much as possible, meaning that I'm going to remove all of this, and I'm just going to say, well, just a sec, remove this, remove this, hello world. So this is the only thing this application is going to do. I, 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 I minimize this as much as I could. This is my application. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to do something that's called make menu config. This is similarly for the Linux kernel, giving me the option to choose what applications, what components and what configuration I'm going to use. So when I do this, I'm going to get this configuration screen where I, where, I, where I can select anything that I want. 
So that means I want to do XT6 and let's see platform. Let's build both the KVM and the Linux user space part. For library configurations, anything, no, let's just use the default ones. Let's not use anything and let's see how this goes. So we're only going to use the default uh, build items. These are going to be configured here. So everything is now configured. And if I look in the config file, now we have here under the config file, this is located here. And you can see any sort of option is now here, config plat Linux U. There's also config plat KVM and many others as well. So this is happening, yay. Let's now, now we configured it, let's now build it, let's do a make. So what the make is going to do, is going to enter the Unicraft folder and it's going to build all those items there and at the end, it's going to create the images. This is the Linux user space image, and this is the KVM image. So build app hello world Linux U. This is just a layer. This is just a, a, an interface layer on top of this. So if I do this, you can see this is an executable, right? So this is just a, an executable similar to what you would have on Linux. Uh, that runs on this, this is not useful for anything except debugging purpose. What's however useful is now we have a KVM image, the one here. So I would be able to use the KVM image to basically run this as part of, uh, of, a, of, a, of a KVM run instance. So I'm going to use this QMO system xt6. Let's see if I remember the command correctly. I think it's minus kernel build. App Hello World KVM. Uh, and I think it's going to be no graphic. Hello World. Right? So this is a, a virtual machine. It's blazingly fast. It's very small. Just a sec. So this is the size of a virtual machine. That's just, of course, it's very simple. It's running Hello World, but it's specifically built just for this. Here, for example, I wasn't able to do a proper configuration. This is, I wanted to show you guys a benchmarking of uh, Nginx. So for example, if I, if I move here into app Nginx, and here, if I did a make clean, I would clean it up. This is a, this is a build of a Nginx. And if I do here, this is the configuration for it. And now if I do a make, you're going to see how everything, so these are core components and the external library components that are going to be built with, within a unified uh, Nginx image. So now everything is built, UK shim layer, VFS core, um, all those items are going to now be compiled and then tied up into a singular Nginx image that's going to be run on KVM. LWIP, the one that's going to be built now, this is uh, what we call a lightweight IP. This is a network stack implementation. Uh, if you work with operating systems, you may know that there is a networking stack as part of a, a Linux kernel. Uh, this, is, um, uh, this is a lightweight IP is an open source implementation of a networking stack that's part of there. Nginx is now built and is going to use this networking stack. And these are the core components of uh, Nginx. Let's wait for this. So this is basically building an application at Nginx, which you, you basically just build for your typical Linux uh, deployment or Windows or FreeBSD or whatever. And now you are building it. This is Peter embedded for uh, thread support. This is required for, uh, for Nginx, the way it works. It, of course, it takes some time uh, because you get all those components that you, uh, you want to be part of the, of the final uh, Nginx image. I think if I use some sort of, uh, this is the library, standard library we're using, it's called new lib. Uh, if you check this uh, item here, uh, this is the new lib library. We are now working towards full muscle support. Muscle is uh, an improved, also lightweight, 
C library. We aren't using the, the glibc, the GNU standard C library, because that's very, very um, heavyweight. Uh, so we are looking for muscle, muscle which is uh, more, uh, more featureful than new lib, but still kind of lightweight, and that will allow rapid porting of a large set of applications uh, on top of the unikernel uh, core uh, library files. So this is still a bit ongoing. Let's wait a bit more. Uh, new libc. Uh, there's also going to be uh, the math part of it, lib, lib, new, lib new libc m, uh, that adds some uh, math support. And uh, with that in mind, you would then have a finalized um, uh, unikernel uh, image uh, that's running uh, nginx. Uh, here, uh, if you, if I were, if I went into this folder, you would see that this is reliant. So this is the application nginx. This is reliant on uh, Unicraft and those libraries: LWIP, lightweight uh, IP networking library, libnginx, which implements the actual nginx core, Peter embedded for thread support, and Ulib. So these are libraries that are already part of our uh, core repository. I'm going to show you a bit uh, of uh, items on that. Uh, this is the math library for uh, new lib. And I think that's kind of the final piece and that will uh, get us the uh, Nginx uh, image um, uh, functional shortly. Okay. This is the glue. Okay. And this is it. So this is the final image. And if you look here, this is the engine X image. It's 834K, everything required. This is a virtual, this is a virtual machine that's going to run uh, engine X. So if I were to do something, uh, this is not going to work uh, uh, as simply as that. So if I'm going to do something like 886 uh, minus kernel, uh, this image minus no graphic, it would basically start this engine X one and uh, and run it. However, uh, I, I I need to boot it with some arguments. Uh, there's some script over here that uh, that starts it. Um, but yeah, I, I need to create a bridge, and I did I, I didn't manage to to go to that. So basically, that that you you once you create this this bridge, the um, uh, the uh, the, the Nginx process would start and then you will be able to test it. And uh, if you look here, these are the these are some metrics going to look through it. And it's uh, it's actually using the WRK uh, benchmark, which is going to cause uh, better performance. I think it's about 20 or 30% increase than a classical unicorn, uh, Linux kernel. That and also being able to run as a small image uh, without all the, all the OSs. So basically you can, you can take this and run it on top of any hypervisor, uh, and it will run just like that. Um, all right, let me show you something uh, that's happening here that will give you a bit of, a bit of a glimpse of the internals of, uh, of the unikernel. So what we did so far, we saw that, okay, there's that main.c, and then everything is linked with, um, uh, with the, the unikernel core, li core libraries, what we call them. So the, those that are part here of this uh, of this repository, but what about the other libraries? So let's assume there are hundreds of thousands of, of libraries out there. How do you port the library? How do you get the library to be part of uh, of Unicraft? Do you, do you have to implement it? How does that go? Well, let me show you. So what we have here, let's look into the libraries that we have for uh, uh, for nginx. So let's look into libLWIP. So in any sort of library, we'll use this make file, uh, a make file. And as part of the make file, any sort of library that we use is going to download the actual source code of that library. That source code is going to be downloaded. There are some patches that are going to be applied and there are also some additional files that I'm going to use. And then you're, going to, you're just going to say, hey, I want these libraries to be part of my build and they, they will be built. So anytime I'm going to use LWIP, these are going to be here. 
So everything that you see here, these are additional items that we added, but the core parts are going to be downloaded. And for example, if we look here into the application of Nginx, uh, sorry, it was App Nginx. If we go into build, and here in build, if we go into LWIP, uh, lib LWIP, I think, mm, lib LWIP, this is it. So if you go here, these are all the build files, but there's an, there's an origin folder here. If we go to origin, then here in LWIP, this is where all the original files are located. So this was basically downloaded and then they were built here. That's how you do so. The, the porting of libraries doesn't mean re-implementing them, God forbid. What it means is you get, the, you get the source code and then you do a bit of tailoring to make that source code compatible with Unicraft. And that's why if you go to the Unicraft uh, organization and then you go, you select, um, there should be a tag here. You select library. Uh, no, uh, I, I knew there was a way in which you can, could select only libraries as part of this repo but uh, I don't know at this point. Ah, no, no, uh, use topics. Okay, this is the one, library. So these are libraries, WebAssembly, Redis, Ducktape, Newlib, Pitted Embedded, LWIP, and all those items are already ported. That doesn't mean they are implemented from zero. You basically, if you go into any sort of, so let's go here, libelf, you go to the makefile.uk, and then you see, that there's some sort of, uh, this, this one is actually not downloaded. It's uh, all the source code in, uh, as part of it. But for example, for libgcc, you go into makefile.uk and then you see that the source code for it is going to be downloaded and then you're going to apply all the, you're going to build all the items that you require directly from the source code. So you're not going to, up to you're going to reuse as much as possible, but there is, an, uh, there is a bit of tailoring required in order to make this properly run with Unicraft. And to highlight that a bit, let's also look into uh, another Hello World item, which is for C++. So a app, Hello World, CXX, oh, CPP, okay. So let's look into this other application and let's see how this works because this requires C++ support. And that means that this is going to require some sort of, um, um, it's going to require what we call the CXX library. So let's look into this. Uh, this is, uh, these are the, no, this is what the, the applications, unbreakable Unicraft, this is here. So let's, let's move here and let's clone that as part of this folder. Okay. Now, oh, just a sec. If we look here, we see that there's, the, there's a make file missing. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to pick the make file from the other folder and I'm going to, to, go, to do my work with it here. So I need some libraries. Let's see what libraries I need. There is a craft YAML file. We're not going to go into this. And it says, I need these libraries. Liban Wind, Compiler RT, CXX, CXX ABI, and Ulib. So those five libraries that have already been ported are required. So I need to, I need to do that. So let's then uh, create the libs folder and get those libraries. Just a sec. So CD into this and let's get those libraries. So uh, we had this git clone. So it was lib minus u unwind. No, it's called lib unwind. Okay. We had uh, lib uh, lib cxx, abi, uh, lib new lib. And what else was there? So it was apps, app hello world dot c minus cpp. It was. Um, I'm going to answer the questions. Oh, it's okay. The questions are here. 
um, no, not this one. We require the craft. CX compiler RT. I need I need compiler RT. So lib compiler RT. Awesome. So I have these libraries here. All the libraries required. Now that I that I have this here, let let's move on to the application folder. So the CPP and let's update the make file. So I need all of this here. Um, so I'm going to say they are part of UK libs. And they're going to use lib, uh, uh, what were there, lib um, unwind. I'm going to require UK libs uh, lib um, cxx, no, lib lib cxx, and this is lib lib unwind. Okay. I'm also going to require UK libs lib lib cxx abi. And I'm also going to require UK libs slash lib minus uh, lib uh, uh, compiler RT. And uh, let's also add new lib. So UK libs uh, lib new lib. I think this should be okay. I'm going to see if, uh, if I missed anything, but uh, things should be okay. All right. Let's now do a make menu config. All right, I got them all. So KVM, Linux user space, and let's get the libraries. So I need compiler RT, CXX, CXX, new lib. Um, I think this should be it. Let's see if anything else requires. So I, I checked all the required libraries. These are here. And um, so this kind of craft YAML file, this is a more an easier way that has everything already compiled and you should be able to build them as they are. Um, let's see if this works. So I did the configuration and now it's going to get everything. So you can see it's now pulling the actual source code, applying patches, pulling the others, applying patches, pulling the other applying patches, and now building everything together. Okay, so something I missed. Um, CXX, so I think uh, this is because the new lib part should be more at the end of this. I think that's one of the items. Let's see if that is the case. I don't know for sure, I know there were some Okay, this seems to be it for now. So the library order does matter because that gives you, okay, and I also need to add the syscall shim layer, make menu config. So I need, you can see that this, this is a bit of a, of a hassle uh, to do, have, to have, the, have things properly done. Usually this is done by this craft YAML part. So this, the, the craft YAML thing uh, is going to, um, um, configure things automatically. I'm now doing things by hand just to show you how the whole process works. So let me also see if the POS 6 CC info is done. Okay, so this should be okay. Okay, let's see. Okay, so uh, what I wanted to show you here is kind of how you be, are part of the development. All those applications that you see here are kind of pre-configured. So you just get them, you, you run the simple commands such as craft and things work. What I'm showing you guys is how, are you, how actual development happens behind the scenes and how things uh, come to be. So you need to update all those make files. You need to go into the uh, different libraries tie them that tie them well together such that in the end you would have the uh, the result that you want and as i said there's uh, ongoing support so if you're going to go to unicraft and if you're going to go into the um, uh, the set of pr so there's quite a lot of work being uh, happening at this point uh, there's something on raw support so this is happening there 
Uh, there is also something I, on DLang. I'm not sure if it's here. So I have DLang runtime support. So there is a lot of things that are currently happening. Uh, there is also something that's SMP support. All those items are currently ongoing. There is a planned release for Unicrop. The, the current version is 0 0.5. Uh, there is a planned, planned release for um, uh, 29th of November at the end of this month for uh, Unicrop 0 0.6 that's going to uh, integrate many of those features and move on uh, kind of further and further towards a more stable release that's going to, uh, to be useful for a larger set of use cases. Currently, on the, on the, this is on the open source side and on the industry business side, uh, there's a target uh, towards getting uh, commercial uh, clients that want to run their applications uh, as a minimalistic, fast, secure virtual machine, doing one thing and doing one thing well. This is now being built, so this is this is going to take a while. Um, but I think you got the idea. This is what's happening. It's now building uh, the C++ support, which is kind of extensive. And with that C++ support, you will be able to build these applications. If I recall, there is... Um, uh, if, it, if, it, if it's not already there, there's a plan for adding boost support for C++, uh, but I think that may already have been ported or some part of it. I don't know for sure. Yeah, there's a lib boost port uh, already happening. Um, so it has a lot of departments. Yeah, so it's using the uh, 171 release. So this is what it really, so it, it relies on multiple libraries, Pthread embedded, uh, Liban, all, all those libraries are already, are already required and they, they have already been ported as part of uh, Unicraft. And yeah, it's done. We have the Linux build. So this is the uh, kind of the uh, compatible one. This is nothing out of the ordinary, it's just simply executable. But then if we use QEMU, if we, if we boot with the uh, KVM as a virtual machine uh, and we use this, so the KVM one, no graphic. Voila, this is Hello World, and this is um, the actual file that was built. Let's see uh, the size of it. So this is this should be lot larger because of the sheer uh, of the sheer size of the C++ uh, libraries. Yeah, so 1.5 megs. That's quite a lot. That's because that's how much uh, the C++ libraries weigh. So it's kind of the same with uh, with Dlang and and Rust and the others. You want to have all those features, but those rely on an extensive size of the um, of the libraries and the and the runtime it uh, uh, it uh, it goes with. Uh, all right, I'm going to stop here. So I'm going to st stop the sharing. Um, so sorry again for the for the um, uh, for that issue with the terminal. So I'm now going to. Uh, leave it to you to, if, you, if there are any questions from, from your side on unikernels and the way Unicraft work and ways in which you can contribute. So once again, uh, this is an open source project. So uh, if you're passionate or interested in contributing the learning of unikernels, OSs, low level topics, C, security, cloud, configurability, software configuration in general, this is a project that you, you're going to find very, very interesting. You can go on GitHub, you can join Discord, then um, be helpful at any time. Any questions or comments? I'm all up for that. Uh, yeah, Muscle is used in Alpine. Actually, Alpine is one of the um, kind of, let's say, the competitors of Unicraft because it's kind of this very small image. And there's also an, uh, a, a topic that's called Linux Planification Project. Um, so there, there are, there are let's say, some competition in this reduced memory side. But um, that's kind of it, not, not, nothing more than that.
And Unicraft, uh, I mean, any Unikernel, Unicraft is one of them. There are some others, Nano VMs and some others, uh, has this advantage of being able to be run directly one application, single address space, reduced code base, uh, fast boot time, fast running time, directly on top of the hypervisor. While, while Linux, you have the application, you have Linux and you have hypervisors. So you have three privileged layers, user mode, kernel mode, and hypervisor mode. With Unicraft, only have hypervisor mode, and then the entire, let's say, kernel mode of the VM. Uh, there is there is also a Eurosys paper that uh, that was presented this year in uh, April 2021, if I recall, or May, one of those two. Uh, there is there was also an event uh, that was called Unicraft Summer of Code. We're going to find a lot of documentation about uh, and and tutorials uh, about. Uh, so these are the, the these are kind of the the steps you can look more into. Uh, let me also link you the, the Eurosys paper that you can uh, find more about. Um, Unicraft. Yeah, this one, just a sec. This is the paper. Oh, no, 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 this one, this one, sorry. And uh, the, the artifacts. So uh, we, we aim to have everything reproducible so you can jump into that artifacts folder and we are able to reproduce all those experiments and check that the results that we are, we are, say, we are talking about there are actually items that you can, uh, you can look into. All right, uh, then if there are no more questions, thank you so much for being part of this. I hope uh, it's something interesting, something you're going to think about as part of the kind of the future of software development and this configurability and uh, high, uh, high availability of large, large amounts of software that we want to use, we want to reuse, we want to tie them as good as we can, as configurable as we can into small secure pieces that we can run securely and fast and uh, efficiently for our use cases. Thank you so much, uh, and uh, we keep in touch. Um, Adina, I'm guessing you're going to take it from here. Yes, yes, Razvan. Thank you. Thank you very much for, uh, for this interesting presentation and for this uh, interactive approach that uh, you've had. I think it was a really nice space of change in uh, in the series that we've been having so far uh, this has been something quite uh, different and uh, i really hope that the the students enjoyed it just as much as i did and i have i'm happy to have seen them uh, joining joining in into the conversation and uh, interacting yeah with I, I, I i was excited as well yeah thank you leo, leo for your feedback i hope you you guys can look more into this it's a very interesting topic and the world of OS is virtualization, cloud, 5G, it's something to look into. And it's always, always, always connected to security. So more that, that's more fun and challenging as it goes. Right, uh, then thank you so much and uh, we keep in touch. Sure, we keep in touch. Uh, have a nice evening. Um, I will, just not to forget, I will be uh, coming back to you with the uh, uh, recording on, uh, yeah. on YouTube. Uh, I'm going to be I'm going to be coming back to you, Razvan, and to the the participants next week. Uh, until then, we'll be seeing each other tomorrow and at another uh, webinar in the series. But just to wrap it up quickly, have a great evening and uh, see you later. See you, everyone. Bye bye. Goodbye. <laughs>